Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where are you at at the globe, but we are here together and I appreciate all the audience, all the participants, all the panelists, and most importantly, I appreciate so much the organizers and the team that supports this platform, both on the side of the United Nations Office at Geneva and the side of the World Academy of Art and Science, incredible teams that have come together to build a platform and a convening space for all these powerful experiences, knowledge generating solutions and, and perspectives to meet together in order to generate a somewhat of a new process of social learning that is our co-learning for the solution generation for the way forward for the new stage of human development. I am Mila Popovic and I'm a member of the executive committee of the World Academy of Art and Science. And I come up to you today um, in that capacity, supporting the project and the event, the e-conference of global leadership in the 21st century. But I also want to announce my participation in one of the roles that I hold very dear that has actually helped me mobilize more and um, associate better with different communities around the world to share common goals and common interests. And that is the role of a performing artist that I've been practicing for decades and find in the arts and the culture sharing a tremendous and underutilized resource for mobilizing civil society in order to um, build new global consciousness, which is the title of our panel. I welcome all of our panelists uh, into the session. And before I ask you to introduce yourself similarly, both based on your formal role, but also based on multiple roles that I'm sure you're playing in your life that allows us to be multilateral individually and collectively. I am going to first introduce our first speaker who joins us um, via video because she um, is in a different time zone where it's difficult to participate and we've tried our best to accommodate all panelists' time zones, but we are really honored and pleased to welcome um, Madam Gabriela Cuevas Baron, who is a famous Mexican politician, who is also um, show, showing up today in the role of the leader um, and the president of Interparliamentary Uner, Union, um, a lady of extraordinary um, capacity that has proven her leadership path and joins us today with an exceptional message to the e-conference and to our panel. To ensure access and fairness in the proposed global platforms, a priority must be to focus on how to make the process inclusive and implement it effectively. Let us recall the 2030 agenda. No one must be left behind. The platforms for polling and referendums must be a mechanism to foster inclusion and increase our capacity to listen to people's needs and demands while avoiding the possibility of having it become a source of political disagreement or conflict, or an instrument that might be excluding millions of people who have no digital access. While it is true that there's a need for more engagement with global civil society, government actors still have a role to play and leaving them out of would be a lost opportunity in terms of inclusion and implementation of the global platforms. Government actors, such as local authorities and parliamentarians have a key role to play in democracies as they have closer engagement with the everyday needs of their constituencies. If we imagine for a second how a major or a parliamentarian is working every day, well, I am, I am myself a parliamentarian in Mexico. I have been in politics all my life as a major, as a parliamentarian. And honestly, it is very difficult to take a decision if you're not considering your constituencies, because then you might be running for re-election or you can go to have a, a walk with a part of your citizens. And at the end, you're going to have that conversation. So when you are a close government to the people that you represent, you know what they want. The real challenge is how to find the most important solutions. In the document, it is noted that this system could turn into a legally binding system to facilitate the global society's input in decision-making processes. This is essential to make sure that the voices that we're seeking to include are not ignored. 
This particular aspect is precisely why government actors must still be included in such processes. Otherwise, the path of implementation may prove to be difficult. As an example, we can talk for hours about how governments and different actors are implementing highly important global agreements, such as the Global Gold, the Paris Agreement for Climate Change, or the Global Compact. While we have governments that are literally doing their homework, we also have some governments that are closing their eyes to a very important reality. What we need also here is government, responsible governments, inclusive and democratic governments. Reaching out to parliamentary organizations and their networks could be useful in increasing the platform's reach, thus increasing the plurality of the opinions that are reflected in polling and referendums. We must take advantage of existing institutions. In that regard, direct engagement and communication with actors at all levels, including local governments and parliamentarians, is also important and is also needed to ensure an inclusive process. Providing them with key messages that informs them of the roles and contributions of global society. In my view, the platforms for polling and referendums must seek to build more coherent interaction with those institutions who already have experience in both knowing the more immediate interest of those who they represent and the assessment and implementation of policy proposals that can address their needs. I would like also to add that I believe that parliamentarians must be part of this interesting effort. Parliamentarians can play a key role here in at least two ways. The first one, they make budget allocation decisions. When it comes to funding, it would be a mistake to overlook parliamentarians. And second, their duty to represent makes a global platform for polling and referendum useful in that regard as they could make better informed decisions for the constituents if they have reliable data that illustrates trends in global public opinion. To be clear, we need inclusive, fully inclusive platforms. We need absolutely transparent and reliable processes. We need both the people and the institutions working in the same direction, yes. Multilateralism needs to work closer with citizens and civil society. That is the only way to defeat populists. But we also need a real route for implementation. It is not enough to know people's demands. We also need solutions. Thank you very much again for this very kind and interesting invitation. Thank you so much. And with this introduction more on the formal side of things where we understand and it has been proven time and again yesterday that all of our institutions and all of our systems need to be transformed. We're now moving more towards what it would take to build a platform at which we could propel um, and propagate the voices of all people, we the people. And that is what Madame Baron is actually referring to, what would it look like? What kind of pro platform would we need to build in order to be able to lend the voice or open up a portal for the voice of the people? And I will now follow up with a little introduction of a proposal that was shared with the panelists, a proposal that we have nurtured and developed in the World Academy of Art and Science with our partners, um, and that I would like us to consider and also get the views of attendees and panelists um, uh, from all over the world in that sense for participation in this discussion as we're already getting questions and insights in the chat that I find really exciting. So I will spend um, some time to discuss this proposal and frame it in terms of what it would look like to build that global consciousness via a, a co-created platform for propelling forward people's voices on their needs, aspirations, and priorities, and how the transformation of current institutions and systems uh, that we have can actually be conjoined uh, with the movement of the people, with the movement and activation of collective intelligence. 
What I found really most rewarding about coming together with you today in the session is that while I listened to a series of tremendous um, explorations of proposals uh, in the midst of the crises that we're facing in the yesterday's sessions, we have seen repeatedly the weight of crises that are upon us. And today in today's sessions, we get a tremendous opportunity to explore social power as that which can actually meet the crises and turn the way we are heading with our development, turn the course in that sense. So what are the possibilities for meeting a complex of crises by the rising of consciousness? How can we be learning from the multi, from the matrix of crises, learning from the intelligences even of the, of the virus and how to meet it by sharing life supporting values as the spread of COVID has become the meta framework along with climate change and economic distress. We, they have become the trifecta of pressures that are now forcing us to see what are the ways to go forward in which we are realizing more and more that it is by activating social intelligence and global social leadership and consciousness for a way forward. So we are currently in this project, in this event, together with you and all our other partners, developing new frameworks such as human security, such as planetary multilateralism, such as new social architecture that are providing a broader and higher field of association and action to transforming our systems that are meant to meet human needs and support human aspiration. In this sense, this new form of, uh, of multilateralism has pushed us to think in terms of plurilateralism, in terms of uh, planetary multilateralism, where all life forms are the stakeholders. In this process of activation of, of social intelligence, we have seen just from the beginning of this century an a total flourishing, I don't want to say an explosion, because it has a more radical, uh, potentially negative uh, effect, but a genuine flourishing and thriving and expansion of capabilities of civil society that possess the knowledge and capabilities essential for addressing global needs. New uh, non-state actors are playing an increasingly more important role in analyzing problems, in shaping political discourse, and influencing public opinion in global society. Just to give you a sense of ma magnitude, we have seen that from an estimated 28,000 of NGOs in the world, in the whole world at the beginning of the 21st centuries, there are now about 10 million. With that right there represents a 350 fold multiplication in only a span of two decades. Approximately 41,000 of them from 300 countries and territories are actively engaged at the international level. This includes intergovernmental IGOs and international and non-governmental organizations, INGOs, with about 1,200, 1,200 new organizations being added each year. If we put that into perspective next to the crises that we've discussed, we realize that the only force, the only force and resource that can meet um, crises are actually the rising of the people, the rising of the people with the new consciousness, scientifically inspired and informed together, finding new ways of mobilizing, convening and walk, going forward. Uh, the efforts of the NGO community to influence governmental policies are strongly supported by the public. Uh, to give you a sense of, of, of that measure, in June of 2020, Globescan survey found that 70 to 94% of those polled in 27 countries strongly and to a great degree support NGO lobbying on issues that are important to them, ranging to us, ranging from education and so social services to corporate behavior, boycotts, and public protests. And one more aspect, which I think it can give us a sense of what it takes to create a tipping point and to generate a, a mass enough to shift uh, mobilizing civil society and people power in that sense. I will quote um, here uh, or refer to a study that was done by um, a scientist, er Erica Chenoweth and Maria Steven, um, in, in the book that they wrote discussing civil resistance, and the book is called Why Civil Resistance Works, pointing out that 
violent revolutions are only half as successful as nonviolent and in long term, always resulting in more violence and, and upheaval, while nonviolent resistance um, are actually 53 more percent successful. And every campaign that engages that kind of means, peaceful means, got activation, and if it got activation from participation of 3.5% of the population succeeded. So every, every movement that engaged nonviolent means and engaged at least 3.5% of the population succeeded and succeeded long-term, meaning it sustained itself over a long wave of activation. And all of them, or some of them actually could succeed even with three with less than 3.5%. I mean, these are facts that are really um, awakening for us to realize how many of us and how many of our organizations in percentage coming together could create that inflection point, tipping point into global social transformation. So to, to give a sense of what is possible, that's how I wanted to frame this discussion and I'll share more later. But what would it take truly to, uh, to create a direct voice of humanity in the age of instant global uh, uh, communication? What would it take to create a direct representation, direct um, representative democracy on a global scale? What kind of finer, higher, and broader order of representation would it, is possible in the age of greatest technological um, and unprecedented connectivity that we have seen that can go for the worse or for the better? One of the projects that we have created is the possibility of combining those uh, resources, membership, and influence of global civil society to create a direct voice for humanity through global platforms for polling and referendums directly involving the world citizenry. The objective of such a platform would be to inform and assess global public opinion. The mechanism would be a global polling platform to generate all of that information and projecting the viewpoints on voting on key issues of relevance to, to global society. The technology would be to, be to stay true to the idea and the vision, uh, inform it would be a decentralized system just to stay true to the idea, which could be a blockchain-based system accessible by mobile phones app to provide security and limit voting on any issue to one voter per unique mobile phone number. And the platform would be a liquid democracy to disseminate information. Participation would be, of course, just like uh, Madam Baron uh, mentioned, it could be all of the IGOs, NGOs, and the public that could have access, which is another question of affordability and accessibility of this, but that's a part that I would love to discuss with you later. And the benefits are tremendous. My key point here would be to round off this introduction that by this, in this way, while we still do not have a platform that would be legally binding by direct voting, but it certainly can project priorities of humanity, values of humanity, and speak across regions, discipline, nations, and unlock the multilateral system in a way to be planetary multilateralism and global civil society that is moving together along the lines of its needs and priorities clearly voiced through a platform like this. To paint the picture in more human terms, I will um, just propose to you what it would look like to have people in Tehran or Seoul or Belgrade or Denver, to mention some of my points in the world, speak the same language through the, the, the language of human needs and aspirations, what it would be look like to speak to each other and reflect in that mirror, into that global mirror, human image that shares universal human needs and human aspirations. No longer could we be told that we are being divided uh, across nation, locked in nation states interests. We understand the need of humanity now under pressure of the virus, of, of the climate change, of economic distress, over poverty and wars and, and insecurity. The notion of global human security now is taking priority. The notion of global human platform to voice its needs and aspirations becomes a pressing need equally. 
In that sense, thank you for listening because this is a massive platform to unleash here. And my question goes to all the panelists to first to introduce themselves uh, this way. I would rather not be introducing, but have you introduce yourself both uh, in terms of what has so far been for you the most important role that you have played in your life's work. And where do you think you have been able so far, hopefully expanding your work forward and legacies forward, what has can be and is currently the role in which you think you're making the greatest personal contribution to social change, realizing your own personal purpose along the lines of common good. So I kindly invite you to share your background highlighting uh, one or two roles that you find the most important for your contribution to a global common good. In that spirit, I am inviting first um, Liberato Bautista from Congo. Welcome Liberato. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Popovich, Mila. Uh, thank you to the UN Office at Geneva and the World Academy of Art and Science, uh, especially Dr. Gary Jacobs for the signal honor of being part of, of this panel. Uh, my name is Liberato Bautista and uh, I am currently the president of Congo, the Conference of Non-Governmental Organizations in Consultative Relationship with the United Nations. We are an NGO. Uh, founded in 1948 uh, with uh, one of the 147 NGOs with general consultative status with uh, ECOSOC at the United Nations. Let me give a few points then uh, as a start. I think today there is a surplus of fear and a deficit of hope among the world's peoples. Humanity survival are at stake in an ever more imperiled and unsustainable natural ecology. The health of peoples and the planet is endangered by intersecting crises that Mila already described in her introduction, not the least uh, health crisis because of the coronavirus pandemic, global violence, forced migration, climate justice, uh, racial injustice, and more. We must increase hope and decrease that fear through arrangements that truly uh, put peoples and the planet at the center of both the local and global public imagination and of public policy action. We certainly need global leadership that will help identify catalytic action and effective strategies for transformative change, such that this uh, conference proposes. Multilateralism as we know it today will no longer suffice for that catalytic and transformative change we're looking for. I appreciate the burden of this consultation and this panel in particular. How can we rally people around the world so that we can address both that fear and hope? Is it going to be true a global platform indeed where we can have a consensus, where we can get a referendum uh, by way of, uh, with no longer the intermediation as it were, of partisan nation-centric political institutions. We need arrangements beyond the multilateralism that we engage today, but definitely ones that enable civil society to claim a space and time at the platform where their views are heard and can impact the decisions made. The multilateral arrangements, not the least ECOSOC 1996 is last 31, the arrangement for consultative status of the UN is failing uh, many civil society, not because on, uh, but also because of shrinking civic space and, and therefore the democratic discourse itself is affected. So as president of Congo, uh, that is my main concern. Global leadership in the 21st century requires a focus and a locus that are at once local and global. It is global leadership whose consciousness and practice is developed and nurtured through transborder and transnational organizing and mobilizing. So I am excited to hear about this proposal of, of building of a global consciousness and I, my, my last plea, uh, and then I'll see the floor, is that because the local and the global are simultaneous realities, we need to develop consciousness that are simultaneous 
simultaneously effective at the local and global level and do not cede only that space and time to globalizers, which NGOs themselves can be a party of uh, at the peril of local initiatives. I'll end it there and welcome the conversation. Thank you so much, Liberat, and I appreciate that you did a uh, brief uh, intro of your position as uh, we would love to really pass this question around of building that platform and have more opportunity for all panelists to, to address it and give ideas. I particularly appreciate your call for global imagination. That is central. Uh, next, I would like to invite Jovan Kurbalia to join us, introduce himself as I kindly asked and uh, give us his initial insight into the topic. Thank you, Mila. It's great to be at the World Academy event, and in particular, event organized by UNOG. As you can see behind me is the building of UNOG and the great connector, David, uh, who has been uh, connecting civil society diplomats and other actors. I will introduce myself through a few images. I think is the best way to, to, to basically present what I'm doing. The first one is, uh, is the question of finding uh, counterintuitive aspects and aspects that cannot be seen easily in interplay between diplomacy and technology. I'm director of Diplo Foundation and head of Geneva Internet Platform. And this drawing of the wandering or wandering birds can the best explain what uh, we have been doing at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at Diplo. Uh, then uh, second aspect uh, where I'm uh, quite involved is the question of uh, uh, reducing lost in translation trying to, and here is lost in tra translation when it comes to the use of uh, uh, simple prefixes. The third one, third image is uh, the attempt to find a way where uh, citizens in particular, but also countries and companies can answer their digital policy or digital governance calls. Because today from removal of the video from YouTube to cyber attacks, we don't have a place where we can place, uh, who we, to we call in all the Kissinger famous saying, whom you call when you want to call Europe. We don't have that, that place and it's important part of my work. And the last image is uh, essentially focusing on building the digital home for humanity proposal, which was advanced by the UN high level panel on digital cooperation when I was a co-lead and executive director and also by the UN secretary general roadmap. In this context, and with this I will conclude, we are working on the platform uh, which has the name Meet 2030, which is starting from very simple assumption that next meeting, including this meeting, this type of meeting should not be held necessarily on the platforms like Zoom or uh, Microsoft Team or uh, other platforms, Chinese and Europeans. It should be held at the open source online meeting platform as a place uh, which could be a digital home for humanity, build inclusive way, transparent as, as open source and reliable, both in terms of uh, access, but also in the terms of protecting data and, uh, and uh, this space where humanity, citizens, companies, countries can get together and discuss digital uh, policy issues. And we are very happy to join this initiative and to share what we have been learning by developing this aspect of digital home for humanity. Over to you, Mila. Thank you so much, Jovan. I appreciate this notion of digital home. Hopefully with all the public investment in the digital space, the humanity only deserves to have its voice projected. <laughs> so next I will call on Cecilia Cannon. Cecilia, welcome, please introduce yourself. Um, my current role is academic advisor to the United Nations for its 75th anniversary. Um, my usual role is at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, where I'm a researcher in the Global Governance Center, working on topics related to United Nations reform and also um, directing one of the executive master programs on international negotiation and policy making. This year, with the generous support of the Swiss government and the Fondation pour Genève, I've been lent to the United Nations to work in the UN 75 initiative team. And this initiative is really um, an, initi an initiative that was launched by the Secretary General in January of this year. Even before COVID-19, the full effects of it were felt around the world. Um, we were facing many global challenges. And the Secretary General decided that in this 75th anniversary of the United Nations, it's not really a time to celebrate. 
And so instead, he launched this global initiative to really engage people around the world in dialogue with the United Nations to talk about what their main priorities and concerns are, very much you know, what, what um, you've been mentioning, Mila, in terms of you know, crowdsourcing people's, getting together people's ideas and, and what their priorities are with respect to global challenges where they most want to see action and what sort of action they want to want to see done by governments, by the United Nations, other actors involved in international cooperation, and also what their sentiments towards international cooperation currently are, including how the United Nations um, can and should innovate, upgrade, etc. So this was, was a year long initiative. We're now at the end and, and you know, myself and, and the entire team are quite bleary eyed from the enormous um, you know, work that, that we've all put in to try and engage on a truly global level people in this, in this global dialogue. Um, but maybe just to reflect, and the, the reach has been, uh, we've, you know, we've, we've managed to reach 1.5 million people through a UN 75 survey that took you know, like a global poll on what people's priorities are, action, proposed actions, et cetera, as well as UN 75 dialogues that could be held by individuals, by organizations. And we've had more than 3000 um, organizations and people register and hold dialogues around the world in more than hundred countries. And we've had people submit summaries of their dialogues so that we can actually look to see what are, what are the things that they got to discuss in more detail that you couldn't really cover in the survey. But a few things, um, you know, three, three or four points just to really consider when setting up these types of global engagement platforms. It's an enormous amount of work, first and foremost, to ensure that it truly is global. Who are you going to work with? Which of the actors and partners do you bring in? And the little team that was set up within the United Nations was made up of, of you know, one person who really had experience working with the business sector, one person who really had experience working with sports associations and, and networks. Myself, I was brought in to really engage academic um, research communities, including you know, academic and scholarly researchers, also policy researchers. We had somebody else you know, from the civil society with a lot of um, you know, reach there. But how can you really ensure that it is a global, uh, it has global reach and global engagement, particularly for example, with communities who are not so connected through the internet, that became, the internet became very important um, you know, throughout 2020 for, for obvious reasons. Um, and this is where actually utilizing the United Nations system with its country offices, with its um, resident coordinator offices and, you know, this global network that's already there to be able to really ensure that it, that it had the global reach that it needed if it's going to have credibility. Sex, um, the second thing to really consider is what is this for? What is the engagement for? What is the platform for? With the sense of who is the specific target audience? Who do you want to listen to these views? Who, how do you package the views that, that come in and for what purpose, in what channels to reach, you know, which, which specific decision makers, which existing governance institutions. So obviously within the United Nations, there's the United Nations as the, the target audience and the secretariat and UN system as an actor. And then there's also all of the member states and other actors involved in, in, in the United Nations work and international cooperation more broadly. But considering the, the, the enormous data that was brought in from 1.5 million people, how do you process and analyze all of this in a meaningful way so that people aren't just talking and speaking, but what they're actually saying can actually lead to concrete action and, and change? And that has been, I think, one of the biggest challenges that we've faced this year. And we're just now wrapping up the analysis and the report writing with many late nights and, and working over the weekends to, to make sure that what people have said can actually be heard and used. And in our own initiative, we've got two concrete channels that, that we're you know, presenting um, you know, people's ideas and, and what their, their, um, their solutions that they have proposed. And one of them is we'll make available a web platform that has all of the data in raw formats, as well as our analysis and results and commentaries by external um, you know, partners and researchers, et cetera, on what people have actually had to say. And then the second thing is we are shaping, we're, we're organizing, analyzing the results that have come in, the data that has come in along the lines of one of the, the current thing, things on the agenda of member states and the Secretariat at the United Nations. The UN 75 declaration contains 12 commitments. And so what we're doing is analyzing and organizing the findings 
along those 12 commitments so that it can be used and, and, and um, hopefully lead to, to concrete action and be considered when the Secretary General presents his recommendations back on those, recommend, those um, commitments. Um, and then finally, just you know, very, very quick thing because it relates to what are people's sentiments. What we've heard through this initiative is that people are suffering you know, the, the, the effects of COVID-19 their immediate priorities and concerns are access to basic services, as well as increased global solidarity um, and support to the hardest hit countries. In the long term, people are really looking um, for action on climate change and the environment as the biggest threat facing us, as well as less conflict and more respect for human rights. And people really have, have um, you know, high sentiments towards international cooperation. They see the United Nations as needing to play a key role and leadership role. However, they want innovation and they want change and they want improvements. So I'll leave it at that, but thank you very much for the opportunity to, to join this conversation. Thank you so much, Cecilia. I really appreciate you pointing to a, a particular that these steps that are important, right? That there's there's the the diagnosis of the problem. There's the vision of how to go forward. We do have it. It's that transitional steps and the leadership it takes, the learning and the leadership synthesis of knowledge and synergy of action that takes to, to take us there. And to be able to translate and interpret individual inputs into a grand narrative then then leads into a framework for action. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you speaking on from within the UN and the realization um, that it needs to be uh, transformed and revitalized. And this is exactly why we are doing this project. Um, next, I would like to call on Alejandro Bonilla Garcia to join us, introduce himself and give, give his initial insight. Welcome, Alejandro. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, whatever you are. Thank you very much, Mila. And thank you very much, the United Nations Office in Geneva and the World Academy of Art and Science for, for having me. I, I think that Liberato, Cecilia, and Jovan had already taken most of the points that I was uh, taking to address here. But in, in any case, uh, I am an actuary by a profession who evolved to finance, to economics, and to development. Uh, my full international career was at the ILO. And then that really obliged me, in a way, to move from science, from finance to economy, to dialogue, to dialogue, to hear the different parts, to understand their positioning and to find uh, consensus, to reach consensus, to reach educated decisions. And that for, for me is paramount. Today, I'm the president of the Association of Former International Civil Servants for Development, which is called, known as Gray Cells. And this is a, an, an amazing association that puts together former UN officials from all the fields of United Nations that are willing to continue communicating, to continue hearing people from all backgrounds and contributing to, to development. Our main angle, and I think that it's a very important angle to be considered in this project, mm -hmm. it's intergenerational acknowledgement, intergenerational com communication. Uh, our main objective, how we describe ourselves, is that we are like uh, bridge builders. We build bridges between generations. We build br bridges between internationals and nationals. We build bridges between the North and, and the South. And this is really extremely, extremely rewarding. And we think we, have, we, can make, we can make a contribution. We relate very much on what the project is focusing on because we organize every year what we call intergenerational dialogues. And we organize almost every month what we call gray, gray talks. And for many of these, we have intergenerational participation in some cases, even to up to 60 countries from all, all over the world. It, it's really amazing. And it shows that uh, communication is it's possible and a value added uh, using technology, it's really, it's really possible. Having said this, I have a few comments. On, on, on the note that was uh, shared to the, to, to the panelists. One, it was mentioned that in ancient Greece, in tiny, in tiny cities in Greece, direct democracy work. But I, I would like to just to remember that in our host country, Switzerland, 
direct democracy works very well now, today, but under one condition uh, in communication, all decisions are preceded by a very strong effort of communication. All decisions and voting and positioning comes after information. So for me, it's, it, it's crucial, but it's complex, it's complex. Y aquí yo quisiera decir algo muy importante en otra lengua, porque es esto. Language is an issue. Communication is, communication is an issue. If you don't communicate in the language, you were supposing that everybody will be able to communicate instantly in English and that that will be processed immediately. We have a problem. In, one, in some of our surveys for the same question, we had two lines responses. And for the same question, we have eight pages as a response in different languages. So to process it, to digest it, this is really, really very crucial. I, I join uh, what Liberato said about trust. Trust is really important and, and a project like this comes with some risks. We all know that the, the internet and worldwide communications are not 100 100% safe that there are cyber attacks even to the greatest powers with the greatest means to protect and that the governance of these multimedia it's it's really it's really an issue there is also the access to 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 communication that was mentioned by by Cecilia just yesterday i was watching television uh, a panel discussion on the access to internet in Europe, in rural areas. Many are discussing and accessing 5G, but many still in Europe don't have even 3G or 4G. And we talk about the rest of the world that that is going to be an issue. So th th that's a problem. And uh, it's not only the possibility, and that, that is something that at Gray Cells we have addressed in a number of, of panels, it's the right uh, of older people in general to access whatever means are made available, but in particular, the, the right of older people to access to technology. Other people, like we all members of Gray Cells, we already represent 16% of the world population. And when the sustainable development world will be reached, we will be close to 20% of the world population. So if we don't have access to these means of participation, there would be just a big exclusion. To me, I would just like to, to conclude by possibly remembering the quote that I sent to the organizers. It's, uh, no one is too young or too old to be heard, to act and to have an impact. Intergenerational awareness, leaving no generation behind is a key building block of inclusive global social consciousness. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to continue Gracias, the panel Alejandro. discussion. Thank you so much. And thank you in your speech for connecting the grand arc of human experience, because we infantilize children and equally infantilize uh, the elders who have walked the earth the longest. And we're using in resource of knowledge and experience in that. So the nurturance of youth leadership which will be the next session after us, as well as uh, sourcing or prospecting the wisdom of the elders and liberating the middle as well in so many ways and connecting that it's so important. So cross-generational, intergenerational voices, cross-denominational, cross-discipline um, and others. Particularly, thank you for pointing out to some challenges in building a platform like this. I want to observe one thing before I pose a question, but I'm posing a question to the panelists and equally to everybody that is participating right now. What I'm noticing emerging in the session, we are compressed, right, within one hour that is Im impossible to think, but how can we squeeze the infinite possibility out of a finite moment? That is the mastery. And I think we can by showing up together like this. What I'm noticing is this tremendous, tremendous energy and tre tremendous e imaginal resource of people that want to share themselves through a session like this. It's a tiny session with limited number of speakers, but the vibrancy of the comments on the side in the chat room are tremendous that I can't even address them. What I can address is that I do see you and that these perspectives are absolutely invaluable. And in the spirit of the project, what we've done, we've just offered 
an invitation. We, we opened a call for action, right? And the question now is, how can you contribute? How can we contribute collectively? And in, in, the, in, in your input, uh, Alejandro, you, you pointed out that we have, first of all, the issue of mobilizing. Then we have the issue of designing the platform, then the question of distribution, and then the question of accessibility, affordability, financing, trust monitoring, right? Legitimizing and finally legally binding that insight that we generate from humanity and then transmuting it into public policy that is holding all of us accountable to common good. I mean, this is a tremendous question and I'm, I'm not able to design this with you today. But this will be an e-conference is only a summative point, a platform from which we will continue to work together. In that sense, to all the attendees and all the panelists, this is a call to action to come together and find ways of aligning action and association, which I know the UNOG and World Academy will provide through Global Leadership 21 um, session. Now, as fast as you can, and uh, good luck to everybody to, to uh, actually participate in this self-reflexive and strategizing uh, moment um, is th if this is the project, the project is the feasibility of creating a common global platform for people around the world to directly project their views and priorities regarding national global issues without intermediation, without intermediation of partisan nation-centric political institutions as we've had them so far. So if that is the mission and the vision, how could such a platform be structured as well as governed to ensure oversight and trustworthy uh, uh, leadership? How can it be managed to ensure access and fairness to all its members and how can it be funded? And uh, this will be a, a, a trailblazing thunder <laughs> across uh, uh, my panel. So I'm going to call on Liberato fast. What would be some key insights, key mobilizing uh, actions that we can take now towards building, monitoring, sustaining, and funding such a platform and mobilizing the people around it? How do we do it? Thank you, Mila. I think the common global platform should be the home for reimagination, as I said earlier, redoing what we commonly know as civics. We need a global civics uh, where we can cultivate, cultivate civic values, where obligations generated by the multiplicity of relations between among, among peoples and nations go beyond traditional notions of national security and sovereignty into ones that foster a people and planet-centered security, including food security, gender security, water security. Secondly, that platform must engender civic engagement, where citizenry goes beyond national allegiances and sovereign assertions. In a global world and cosmological existence, we need global citizenry and human solidarity where welfare and cosmological well-being are primordial over wars and other death-dealing activities and natural catastrophes. Lastly and third, that common global platform must foster civic action, which is oriented towards social justice so that every activity from grassroots, local, national, regional to international, by people's governments and multilateral institutions redound to the improvement of the relations of peoples and nations. And if this project of a global uh, uh, platform speaks to those civic values, civic engagement, civic action, which I summarize as an infrastructure of hospitality and an architecture of solidarity. That infrastructure of solidarity on the ground is so much needed because people are so alienated from processes that do not harness and do not do a referendum of what they really want. And the architecture of solidarity is the platform where all of the intersecting institutions must collaborate together. Thank you so much. Yomane, would you like to go next in the same order? 
sure. A few suggestions from a long experience of creating platform for 25 years. I call uh, my graveyard of platforms when uh, good people come with good intentions and they fail. Out of, uh, I would say, maybe 5% of platforms survive because they were technology driven and they were not embedded in the social context and emotional context. That would be first, first strong advice. Uh, to make it more, well, I can call beer to beer or T to T context than peer to peer. Uh, that's the first, the first important point. Second point is to deliver very fast. With mid 2030, we started for last, when COVID started with consultations. And then we realized that we have to deliver the product. Therefore, in January, we'll deliver the platform, open source platform for online meetings. Therefore, people like that. They are a bit tired of the, of the, of the general narratives and the nice words, which are important, but they are, they're very important. And the last point is the science technology can help us to make nicer life. But uh, if I can quote Dostoevsky, beauty ultimately will save the world. And we need to rely more on arts, on emotions, on core humanity, uh, while using science and technology as useful tool. Unfortunately, Mila, I'll have to leave in a few minutes. It was really great to be today at the panel uh, with you and other colleagues. And we're looking forward to develop further this idea. Um, if you want to hear more about MIT 2030, which will be launched in January, please let us know. I wish you a good discussion and it was really great to be today with you. And Thank you, don't Yoman. forget, it's a bit freaky with the wireless technology. Bye-bye. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Yoman. And we count on your contribution and collaboration. Thank you so much. Cecilia, would you like to uh, bring forth your quick tips yes. <laughs> for tipping the world? Three, um, three suggestions would be, first of all, to work with, with part uh, existing networks and, and associations and make use of, of partner networks for reach and really ensuring that it's a global initiative. Second, really clarify who your end target audience is and what the purpose of, of gathering the views um, you know, of people around the world um, is um, with respect to what will you do with those views proposed, which specific decision makers will you actually be working with, um, you know, what processes do you want to engage in and package the, and, at the analysis of what, what comes into the platform so that it can actually have meaning and, and um, purpose? And then finally, you know, just make sure that it's, it's not, um, uh, you know, what the scholars in the, in the academic literature on NGO engagement and civil society engagement um, uh, in policy processes often talk about, that it's not taken over by gatekeepers who, who ends up being, you know, a few organizations and civil society organizations that are heavily involved, um, but really ensure that it's open um, to everyone and, and global engagement. Thanks. Thank you so much. Alejandro. Please unmute yourself, sir. I mute. Well, thank you very much. I think that um, timing is everything. Timing is everything. If this project had come, uh, had been thought 20 years ago or 40 years ago, the situation would be completely different. But now, Every day, many people in the world are struggling just to end, meet ends every, every month. When I walk the cities of most countries where I had missions, I, I can tell you that um, many people were just in a way surviving this global glo world, and they were not many concerned about global, global objectives. So to me, reaching them and showing to them that they can have some ownership on the decisions and that the global decision will have an impact on the global day, it, it, it's, it's paramount. Knowing our subjects, getting close to them. And I think to me, this calls not to the traditional new way of having questionnaires or surveys through internet, which is only accessible to a certain part of people, but possibly including in the platform a mix of state-of-the-art modern technology and some traditional technology. In, in internet, we can hear almost every radio in the world. In internet, we can have access to almost every TV station. And in YouTube, you have all kinds of TV stations. So possibly the mix, people might not be willing to answer a questionnaire, but, may, may, but they might be willing to take the floor 
and comment what are their, their views on the issues that we would like to have their opinion. So I think this mix is really important and ownership, ownership and reaching people, the vast majority of people in urban and rural, rural areas all over the world, North and South. So I think it, it's a very complex, it's a very ch challenging project, but, and it has to use all, all means available. Thank you very much, Mina. Thank you so much, Alejandro. I'm just going to, again, um, point you to a brilliant uh, conversations and offerings in the chat. And I want to recognize everybody here that I've read your comments. I wish I could read them out loud because we'll have to round off the session, but please understand that this session was just an opening, a portal into the discussion and future collaborations. And in that sense, I want to invite everybody that is here to really with the birth of a platform like this, be the supporter and be the channel for the voice of humanity in terms of um, realization that reaching um, SDG, Sustainable Development uh, Goals, as unprecedented consensus of, you know, all the nations, not 193 nation states on the plan for the future, on the plat uh, priorities of humanity is only one part of the process, uh, a long painstaking process, but without filling that with human motivation, with human inspiration, with activating um, human networks and associations and communities on all scale of association, there will be no human counterpart to generate life to, to realize SDGs and they will not have the, the same kind of meaning as I'm sure Cecilia is what she was pointing to. So my, without being able to ask you another questions, but with this wonderful blast of insight, I'm inviting everybody to get in contact with us to actually generate those ideas. We have a particular questionnaire on global leadership in the 21st century on the website of worldacademy.org. Send us our, your insights, send us your ideas, send us your support and also ways in which you think we can come together and the ways you could contribute. And we hope to be that safe, convening, trustworthy space where we can jointly project the voice of humanity forward for the first time. I appreciate you all wishing you well, stay lifted and stay connected. Have a wonderful day.